the centuries has seen the start of many a journey. Her ancient buildings echo great tales of travel and adventure, and not by chance does London hold the title Capital of the Commonwealth. For from here her men set forth to the far corners of the earth to build a great community of nations. Nor are their stories all of long ago. This story is a modern one, and it started in the very heart of London on a bright winter morning in 1952. Three men and a motor car set off on a journey, a journey which even in these days is reserved for adventurers only. Their destination, Cape Town. The leader of this venture looks the part, and many an English sea dog could have envied George Hinchliffe's beard as he signed the official documents prior to departure. For this was to be no leisurely trip with time no object. This was to be a record-breaking run, 10,500 miles against the clock, officially timed by the Royal Automobile Club of South Africa and crossing some of the toughest country in the world. And as the car moved off from Hyde Park Corner, the people passing on their way could scarcely have dreamed what lay ahead of this heavily laden vehicle. But Hinchliffe knew. Twice before he had made this journey, already he held the record for the run, 21 days, 19 hours, 45 minutes. And as he weaved his way through the friendly traffic, one wonders what he was thinking. For this run was to be faster still. A more powerful car this time, a new car, the 4-litre Humber Super Snipe, a car designed for Britain's customers abroad, and this run was to prove its powers. And as the streets of outer London went flicking past Hinchliffe's camera, one wonders what his crew were thinking. Like him, they were hardy Yorkshiremen, but to Arthur Longman and Robbie Walshaw, this was to be a new type of motoring, and the road ahead would certainly call for all their North Country courage and stubborn purpose. Across the Kentish Downs lies Lim Aerodrome, the first objective. A childishly easy run, a prelude, almost a mockery. And there the car was driven aboard the big air freighter for the quick trip across the channel. And so, to France. But at Le Touquet came a minor setback. Maybe it was the Hinchliffe beard that raised doubts in his mind, but the customs official was very curious, despite the aid of a charming interpreter. Eventually, the long straight roads of France, wintry with ice and snow, but still a joy in a fast car. And soon winter was left far behind for the sunny shores of the Mediterranean, but over that warm horizon lay the proving ground. Africa, the largest continent, the dark continent, to be crossed from north to south along the 9,000 miles of desert and jungle track and mountain pass, which is called the Hogger Route. The Sahara, over 2,000 miles of thirsty wasteland. Across the Tropic of Cancer, the scrubland, and into the eternal jungles of the equator. Easting across the continent, where even the place names weave their own magic. The Rhodesias, and into the great territory of the Union. The hard way to the Cape, the Cape of Good Hope. From Algiers, the roads are good and fast, and the coastal strip could well be the country of southern France across the sea. But soon the road climbs up into the great range of the Atlas Mountains, which stand as the northern sentinels to the Dark Continent. And here a landslide caused an early and unexpected delay.
But there's no mistaking this, as the modern mind sweeps past the transport that has served men since Babylon and before. The road fades, the tufts of camel grass grow more sparse, and this is the Sahara. Wheel tracks in the sand, an occasional pile of stones. These are the signposts for the next 2,000 miles. But even those wheel tracks are themselves a snare. Where the crust of the sand is broken, the wheels of a car will sink. And Hinchliffe and his two companions kept the tires of the Humber well clear of other tracks. The car must be kept moving and moving fast. And in the glare and dust and shimmering heat, the man at the wheel must concentrate 100%. But as the travellers press on into the wilderness, the desert strikes back. The crusted sand softens and the wheels spin uselessly in this arid quagmire. Inevitably, this is the result, not once, but many, many times. And then out come the rolls of wire sand mats, but once the car has stopped axle deep, digging and jacking are the only way to get free. The sharp sand cuts the skin, gets behind the fingernails, pricks the eyes. The sun burns down, the minutes tick by, the water's getting short, and the nearest human being is hundreds of miles away. Only the rocks, as old as time, break the horizon. At last, the treacherous sand hardens again, and here the French authorities have marked the trail with tall steel posts, comfortably solid in this wilderness of mirages. The miles go flicking by, but not for long. Less than a hundred miles after the oasis at Taman Raset, a flying stone pierces a petrol tank. Out comes the equipment. They carry 45 gallons of fuel, 12 of water. It's nearly 500 miles to the next well, and Hinchliffe makes a bold decision. The water is thrown away. The fuel from the damaged tank is drained off into the water tank, and the tank is repaired. As they move on again, Hinchliffe knows that if the car should fail them now, before they reach the next well, it means disaster. But his confidence is justified. The 500 miles are covered, the village and the well are reached. The guidebooks describe this country as a sea of stones. Well, it may be a suitable sea for the ships of the desert, but to the modern motor car, these mountains on the trail to Arak ensure a rough crossing. But the cruelty of the desert softens with the sunset, and 75 hours after leaving Algiers, the Sahara had been crossed. Quickly now, the vegetation thickens. Camel grass, thorn trees, larger villages closer together. Here it rains. It's an event when it does, but a motor car is an event too. And when Hinchliffe saw this mud, his heart fairly leapt. But the blessing of water already provided some tricky hazards. At least in these temperatures, it doesn't take long to dry the engine off. French Equatorial Africa, the Lake Chad territory, and the first of the 17 primitive ferries which had to be negotiated. This is a relatively quick one, 
But even so, to men fighting both nature and the clock, delays like this were maddening. Hinchliffe used the time to good purpose with his camera. Getting the heavy car aboard contrivances like this called for a lot of skill, but the Humber was designed with lots of clearance for just such emergencies. Horsepower may be the key to the white man's world. Down here, it's manpower, black manpower. Now tall elephant grass presses to the very edge of the track and almost anything is liable to step out into the road. On the banks of the Congo, the Roots Group agent has everything laid on for servicing the Humber. This could be Europe. Or could it? Securing the heavy equipment necessary for this marathon journey was a problem in itself. But having someone to lend a hand at all made a pleasant change after the Sahara. Hey, you've forgotten to close that boot. But there was not far to go, only a few hundred yards to the next stop. And that, a significant milestone on the route, the crossing of the Congo. Here, the party were joined by a platoon of sepoys, and these chaps know too the hardships the forests hold in store. Ah, Dr. Hinchliffe, I presume. But even this modern ferry had its problems. What's get a move on, chum, in the local language? And what's this, bulldozing the opposition? Ah, a little well-placed leverage provides the answer to that one. And so, on again, south from the Congo, and in good heart despite it all. The modern African is rapidly becoming transport-minded, and these British bicycles were a welcome reminder of home. Good progress was made along some of these dirt roads, and the speeding car drew a lot of delighted attention from local hikers. in small gardens hacked out of the forest is one of the village's main crops and like farmers everywhere the little black folk are dead with anyone but when it comes to a scramble for sweeties well there's certainly no language problem here hmm the concours d'elegance of the congo As a proving ground, Africa certainly offers a wide variety of tests. For miles on end, the way was deep in flood water, and since the surface here consisted largely of tree trunks, the road was literally floating.
Narrow streams are roughly bridged with planks and spares are left hard by in case the original ones are washed away. Food during this trip consisted mainly of stuff out of tins, but in this sort of country there's certainly no need And now the forest grows thicker yet. The track tunnels its way through the thick vegetation and it was even necessary to use the headlights at high noon. The constant variation from steamy darkness to brilliant light played tricks with tired eyes. And to men who had been traveling day and night for eight days now, the effort of concentration became an ordeal in itself. By now, the party were barely holding Hinchliffe's schedule for the route. They had covered 7,000 miles. There were still more than 3,000 miles to go to their destination, and the need to make haste on this fantastic journey was uppermost in their tired minds. But time stands still in equatorial Africa, and George Hinchliffe knows the difference between impatience and determination. Forty natives plying paddle and pole from the dugout canoes which support this ferry, here was a moment for relaxation. In accordance with tradition, the Humber carried presents for the native folk and a few brightly coloured scarves were as successful with the men of fashion as with the ladies. Arthur Longman, however, seized this break the other way. On then they pressed southeastwards from the Congo, sometimes at speed, sometimes with desperate delays, dirty, unshaven, their baggy tropical shirts clinging to their skins, on through the endless miles of steaming forest. At last, the frontier they longed to see, the turning point of their adventure. From now on, conditions should be easier. But 80 miles an hour in northern Rhodesia certainly raises the dust and engines as well as men have to breathe to keep going. Andola in the copper belt meant civilization, good service for car and crew and relief from the pressing heat of the equator. These roads may not be highways by normal standards, but the twin tarred strips are fine as long as you can stay on them. And now the signposts bear names that ring in history. The travelers of bygone years struggled here to pave the way, and the territory itself is their memorial. Now it was all out on the final lap. Regardless of what the car had conquered and endured in miles passed by, now the call was speed, and 90 miles an hour was held whenever the road was straight enough. The final mountain range, the final pass lofting to 3,000 feet in the Prester John country. rich, vast landscapes of the Union of South Africa, smiling a welcome to the final 1,300 miles of tarred road from Baitbridge. Then the vision.
vineyards and the shadow and the sunlight and scanning the broken skyline for that last great landmark. And this was their journey's end. At Shelmeck's house in Cape Town, the timekeepers were waiting. Their verdict, 13 days, 9 hours and 6 minutes for the 10,500 miles from London to Cape Town. A new record, a record of speed and endurance. A journey for adventurers only. A journey which won a place of honour on the scroll of modern achievement for four names. George Hinchliffe, Arthur Longman, Robbie Walshaw, and the Humber Super Snipe.